Good afternoon, Honorable Sri Ravi Shankar Prashad, Minister of Law and Justice and Communications, Electronics and Information Technology. Honorable Mr. Justice Sanjay Karol, Chief Justice, Patna High Court. Honorable Mr. Justice Chandramauli Kumar Prasad, Chairman, Press Council of India. Honorable Mr. Justice Anant Vijay Singh, Member Judicial, NCLAT. Honorable Mr. Justice S. N. Jha, Former Chief Justice, JNK, and Rajasthan High Courts. Okay. Honorable Judges, other dignitaries, Mr. Ashok Chhabra, President Atmabod, ladies and gentlemen. I am Dr. Maurya Vijay Chandra, Advocate Supreme Court and Secretary of Atmabod, an All India NGO dedicated to the cause of human rights and access to justice. It is a privilege for me to convene this centenary memorial lecture to celebrate the life and achievement of late Thakur Prashad or Thakur Babu, as he was fondly known. This initiative of Atmabod began in May last year with the first late Dr. S. N. Jha Memorial Lecture on Administrative Law. Ever since, we have been organizing these lectures to inspire ourselves from the virtues and values that stalwarts of Patna High Court embody. This is the seventh lecture in the series. We have had lectures in the memory of late Abhay Kumar Singh, late Srinath Singh, late Justice P.S. Mishra, late Chandrasekhar, late Braj Kishor Prashad. We are still taking baby steps and we solicit your support to keep marching ahead. This is the 100th birth anniversary year of Thakur Babu. He was born in 1920. Thakur Babu attained a master's degree in economics and then completed his LLB from Patna Law College in 1946. Initially, he took up a job as a sub-editor of the Indian Nation a prominent regional newspaper of its time. However, due to personal reasons, he left the job and joined the legal profession. He was a junior to Mr. Sarju Prasad, who later became Chief Justice of Assam. He had a roaring practice on the civil, criminal and writ side. His client following as a lawyer included industrial houses like Tata Group, Hopper Group, Dabur, Bennett and Coleman. He was an RSS activist and a founder member of Jansang in Bihar. He was a luminary lawyer of Patna High Court, who also became the industry minister of the state of Bihar in 1977. Thakur Babu is credited as the first to have brought the single window clearance system for industrialization of Bihar. Thakur Babu left for heavenly abode in 1994. He left behind a legacy that is evident in the panel of speakers today. We will hear more from the distinguished speakers today who have known him as a guru, <laughs> as a father and as a senior colleague at bar. Today's proceedings will begin with a welcome address by Mr. Ashok Chabra. Mr. Ashok Chabra is a respected lawyer and has been practicing on the civil and writ sides of Delhi High Court and also in the Supreme Court since 1974. He has been a standing counsel for the MCD. Above all, he has been a beacon to Atmabod and guided us through the two decades of our existence. He has encouraged us all along and kept us focused on our objectives. I now request Mr. Ashok Chhabra, advocate and the president of Atma Vote since 1999, to welcome the guests and the participants. Over to you, sir. Control room, please unmute Mr. Ashok Chabra. Honorable Justice Ajay Bijoy Singh, Member Judicial NCLAT. Honorable Mr. Justice S. N. Jha, former Chief Justice of JNK in Rajasthan High Court. Honorable Judges of Patna High Court and other dignitaries, Dr. Maurya Vijay Chandra, Advocate and Secretary Atambod, all colleagues who have joined us from Delhi, Ranchi, and Patna. On behalf of Atam Bodh, the entire organizing team, it is my privilege to welcome the dignity speakers and lawyer colleagues. First of all, I would like to pay homage to the great personality in whose memory we have gathered here. 
On behalf of Atom Bodh, I extend my warm welcome to Shri Ravi Shankar Prasad for making this event possible. We are aware of your busy schedule and the huge responsibility that you share. We welcome you, sir, to deliver the keynote address today. I also welcome Honorable Mr. Justice Sanjay Karol, Chief Justice Patna High Court. We have known you, sir, for a long time, but it is the first time that we have the pleasure of having you speak in one of our events. We are entrilled. A very warm welcome to you, sir. Honorable Justice Prashad has agreed to share some of his personal memories of the late Thakur Prashad, without which any memorial lecture would be incomplete. Today, though these narratives, we will also get an insight into your personality, not as a judge or a public figure, but as a disciple in the noble profession. A warm welcome to you, sir. Honorable Mr. Justice Anand Vijay Singh has started his career at Patna High Court and has accomplished many feats. He also spoke on the subject of data privacy in one of our earlier workshops. We acknowledge his contribution and a warm welcome to you, sir. I also extend my warm welcome to Honorable Justice S.N. Jha, former Chief Justice of JNK in Rajasthan High Court. You are a hero, sir, and we look up to you as a model of conducting ourselves in profession and life. Your presence is extremely enriching. I also welcome honorable judges of Patna High Court, Jharkhand High Court, and other dignities who have joined us today. And very warm welcome to all the dignities and the participants who have come to celebrate the life and personality of late Thakur Prashad. I would now like to introduce few aspects of Atam Bodh to the audience. Atam Bodh is an embodiment of the self-reflection of a group of students of the Campus Law Center class of 1997, led by Dr. Vijay Chandra, with encouragement from the seniors from the bar and professors at the Campus Law Center. He also formed with a vision to pursue. Atam Bodh began his journey in the year 1999 with patronage of late Honorable Justice B. R. Krishna Iyer, former Judge Supreme Court of India. Dr. S. N. Jha, who was a senior advocate of Patna High Court, was also among one of our patrons. We are also grateful to Honorable Justice S. N. Jha for his patronage. Atam Bodh has been consistently engaging in capacity development of lawyers and law students and lawyers across India. First major project of Atam Bodh was to bring a booklet on rights and duties of the prison inmates. The booklet in six native districts of Bihar was prepared by law students of Patna and was published with generous financial support of aid and advice based in the Patna High Court. The booklets were released by Honorable Justice Krishna Iyer himself. In 2000, Adam both organized capacity building workshop for law students in Patna for protection of the child rights and to secure their release from the prisons. This initiative was kick-started by a workshop inaugurated by the then acting Chief Justice of the Patna High Court, Honorable Justice B.P. Singh, and Mr. Suraj Narayan Prashad Sinha played an active role in it. Atam Bodh also organized a lecture series on human rights and criminal justice reforms, which was delivered amongst others by the then chairperson of the NHRC, late Honorable Justice J.S. Verma, Gopal Subramaniam, senior advocate, and the then professor in charge of the campus law center, Professor B.B. Pandey. Atam Bodh also organized lectures at the Center for Human Rights of the London School of Economics on Indian Perspective on Human Rights, which was delivered by the Professor M.P. Singh of Faculty of Law, Delhi University, a renowned constitutional expert, and Mr. A.K. Mehta, a renowned mining law specialist in the Jharkhand High Court. Since November 2012, Atam Bodh has been conducting a series of workshops on applied aspects of law in various law schools of NCA region. Delhi High Court Bar Association, District Bar Associations of Delhi, Bar Council of Delhi, Jharkhand Bar Council. It has organized over 100 one-day workshops till date, where domain knowledge is shared along with the practical training involving areas of law. Areas of law included law relating in privacy, criminal trial, and arbitration, intellectual property rights, CPC, etc. 
Honorable Justice Deepak Mishra, then Judge Supreme Court of India, Honorable Justice Pradeep Nandara Jog, then Judge Delhi High Court, Honorable Justice S. Murli, the Judge Delhi High Court, as also Honorable Justice Apesh Kumar Singh, Judge Jharkhand High Court, Honorable Justice Dinesh Kumar Singh, Honorable Justice Ashutosh Kumar, Honorable Justice Anmit Kumar, Upadhyay, Honorable Justice Sanjay Kumar, Honorable Justice Mohit Kumar Shah, Judges of the Patna High Court, among others, have delivered inaugural plenary lectures in the workshop. In 2018-19, Adam both carried out a campaign to build the capacity of the lawyers at the district level in the field of arbitration. Workshops were held in Delhi, Patna, Mujaffarnagar, Dharbanga, Bhagalpur, Gaya, and other places. As a part of Adam both mission to increase access to justice through the capacity building of the lawyers. In the wake of COVID-19, the functioning of the court has changed. At anticipating this hurdle in implementing the e-courts, Atom Bodh has since 25th of March 2020 began working with the lawyers of Delhi, Patna, Ranchi and other towns to upskill them to conduct the court hearing via video conferencing, e-simulation workshops enabling hands-on experience of how to present the case document using video conferencing Futures in order in to help them argue and virtual course as well as learn e-filing and maintaining e-offices. <clears throat> E-court environment is stipulated in these e-sessions by the Dr. Maria Vijay Chandra Advocate, Supreme Court and participant advocates learn the skills required for arguing e-courts and practice through these simulation briefs. The month of training culminated in Dr. S. N. Jha Memorial E. Mount Court competition on 26th of April 2020. The moot court was judged by Honorable Justice Dr. Anil Kumar Upadhyay, Judge Patna High Court, Honorable Justice Mohit Kumar Shah, Judge Patna High Court. Around 100 lawyers from Delhi and Patna have already attended so far these East simulation workshops, including lawyers on the panel of the central government in Patna. A team of 10 lawyers has also involved further disseminating learning across the region. Without taking any more of your time, I once again welcome all the speakers to this late Thakur Prashad Sinistri's Memorial Lecture and eagerly await the pearls of the wisdom that the speakers are going to show on us. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for your uh, welcome address. We now have opening remarks from Honorable Mr. Justice S. N. Jha, former Chief Justice of JNK and Rajasthan High Court. <clears throat> Justice Jha joined Bar in 1969 and practiced mainly on the civil side. He was junior to Mr. Tarakan Jha, a distinction he shares with the likes of Honorable Justice uh, B. N. Agarwal. He was a government counsel for a long time. He was elevated as a judge of the Patna High Court in July 1990 at a very young age of 41 years. His tenure in Patna High Court was momentous. He never missed a court day and always sat on time. Most importantly, he presided over the Fodder Scam Monitoring Bench and became an icon of independence of judiciary and fight against corruption in Bihar. He was appointed Chief Justice of Jammu and Kashmir High Court in January 2004 and was transferred to Rajasthan High Court as Chief Justice in October 2005. In June, June 2007, he was appointed President Customs Excise and Service Tax Appellate Tribunal but then resigned and joined as founder chairperson of Bihar Human Rights Commission in November 2008. After completing his tenure, he now practices in the Supreme Court, is arbitrator in many cases, and also heads commissions, a commission of inquiry on Jat agitation in Haryana. To Atmbodh, he is a patron and a beacon. He has always been available for our programs and ready to spare time whenever we want. His presence inspires us, and we feel blessed to have him around. When we, became, when we were contemplating district level training programs on arbitration, his consent to participate in, those, participate in those cleared all doubts we had, and we organized six training workshops in Muzaffarpur, Gaya, Darbhanga, Patna, Bhagalpur, in which about 300 advocates participated over a period of six months. His unassuming personality keeps us in awe. I now invite Honorable Mr. Justice S. N. Jha the force behind today's program to deliver his opening remarks. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Maria, for the nice words. Most of which I don't deserve really. Uh, uh, Shankar Prasad ji, Indian Minister in charge of Law and Justice, Electronics, IT and Communication, 
और जस्टिस चंदमौली कुमार प्रसाद जस्टिस संजय करोल चीफ जस्टिस पटना हाई कोर्ट जस्टिस आनंद विजया सिंह मेंबर नेशनल कंपनी लॉ प्लेट ट्रिब्यूनल मिस्टर अशोक छावरा प्रेसिडेंट आत्मबोध मिस्टर मौर्य विजय चंद्रा सेक्रेटरी आत्मबोध जजेज ऑफ दटना हाई कोर्ट एंड झारखंड हाई कोर्ट एडवोकेट्स लेडीज एंड जेंटलमैन we are assembled today in memory of late uh, prasad a leading advocate social worker and intellectual of his time and to pay to him with the uh, guidelines of lecture on the topic which is one of the most relevant and burning issues of the present time instantly i may inform many 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 of the audience may not be knowing that uh, mr prasad in with us today to have in 100 years old he completed 100 years in till 2020 born on 21 april 2019 uh, so it's a, it's a coincidence that we are organizing this memorial lecture in the centenary year uh, i have very fond memories fond and respectful memories of lit mr prasad he is gone by are very fascinating especially when they remind you of your struggling days i had the privilege of not only uh, being a contemporary a junior contemporary at the bar in the patna high court but also uh, assisting him in a number of cases uh, sri thakur prasad possessed a very handsome and charming persona and a deep intellect and uh, it was a treat to hear him coming to the topic in hand i am reminded of a, a whatsapp message a message i got i, I saw some time back a gentleman orders pizza on for home delivery now the lady at the counter he says pizza is not good to ask for him considering his health condition she tells him about his health report when he asks him how do you know about my health report is that we are connected to the system then when it comes to payment he says no we don't want to accept payment by credit card because you are in area you have not you have uh, so much is due against your card card you have to pay by atm or something like that then uh, 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 some kind of conversation uh, or conversation ensues and then she reminds him that don't lose temper you have been prosecuted you have been spent uh, one night in police station you were involved in the, because of a, a, a brawl that were involved so so the system and every time he is how do you know sir as i told you i am connected you are connected to the system every time she says you are connected to the system therefore the system the so called system is aware of not only his uh, predilections his health status his financial status and uh, his personal record criminal record so this is the topic this is thing that is important now if you ask me my name i won't hesitate giving my name but if you ask me about my details then i should hesitate why should you ask me for about my email id perhaps i could part of the email id also but you say no give me your password or give me your aadhar number perhaps one would not so so, so this is this is this is the treasure this is the, 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 the information the information which is contained in the form of data is uh, is, is not is very is personal to the person and as the supreme court held in the recently in the case put to swami's case it is a part of right to privacy privacy right is a part of fundamental right and the uh, privacy of pers personal data and facts is an essential facet of the right to privacy now uh, the the supreme court said that the nine types of privacy ninth type is so said to be informational privacy the supreme court of informational privacy is a facet of right to privacy the dangers to privacy in an age of information can originate and not only from the state but from non state actors as well the creation of such a regime requires a sensitive balance between individual interests and legitimate concerns of the state the legitimate aims of the state would include 
personnel protecting national security preventing and investigating crime and encouraging innovation and the spread of and the prevention uh, and preventing the description of the social welfare benefits therefore uh, the the we we are living in an age where life is almost impossible if we restrict ourselves to our restrict to ourselves our restrict our data to ourselves for financial transaction we have to share huge amount of personal data with businesses for healthcare we share even more sensitive personal data with healthcare institutions for navigation needs we share uh, real time location data with service providers for communication we share our data with service providers examples can be multiplied endlessly the point is on the one hand we have the an inviolable right to our personal data and on the other hand we are required to share uh, it both for our needs and economic progress how to balance the two there comes the need for a regime i don't wish to refer to the earlier legislations on the subject like indian telegraph act 1985 1985 or official secrets act 1923 or the common law relating to confidential and privileged information in the light of the opinion expressed by the supreme court and the and the recommendation the government has 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 to enact a personal data protection law and the bill which was tabled in the parliament by Mr. Ravi Shankar Prasad, who is with our in our midst, in December 2020, if I remember correctly, and it has been referred to the Joint Reference Committee, the Select Committee of the two houses, and it is pending with them. Perhaps because of the onset of the Corona pandemic, pandemic, uh, they think this is hanging fire. Otherwise, it would have made substantial progress by now. So, the as as the preamble, as the preamble of the Act says. Uh, to provide for protection of the privacy of individuals relating to their personal data uh, specify the flow and usage of personal data protect the rights of individuals whose personal data are processed to create a framework for organizational and technical measures in processing in processing of data and so on therefore the very detailed uh, provisions have been made have been suggested in the in the bill and uh, it is hoped that the uh, the the at that after the bill is enacted by finally passed by the parliament and becomes law then the uh, the the proper regime for protection of the private rights and the also the uh, the, the utilization of the data will be in place now data security and data protection is important for the country and economy in more ways than one personal data protection bill is a significant step in the right direction it will consolidate the law around data protection data localization and control over export of data excessive delegation of power uh, has of course that, 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 that in some quarters uh, there is a criticism that uh, there is excessive delegation of power in favor of the authority and uh, the but then that is that because it is still pending with the uh, joint committee and and maybe that there some amendments some modifications they have made in the bill the proposed bill so i think it's too tight to discuss it with that those aspects so uh, we, we we the bill is being piloted by by our able law minister mr shankar prasad and i think we are safe the country is safe in his hands and we will hear more about the bill and the, the, the contours of the personal data when it comes so with these words i close my speech and thank you for listening thank you your lordship for setting the context for today's uh, deliberation so beautifully our next speaker in is honorable justice chandramouli kumar prasad he assisted thakur babu as a junior Justice C.K. Prashad began his career by enrolling as an advocate in 1973 in Patna High Court 
as an independent lawyer, he practiced in civil, constitutional, criminal, and service matters in Patna High Court and was designated as a senior advocate in 1989. He was appointed at the, as the additional advocate general of the state of Bihar in 1993. He was elevated as a permanent judge of the Patna High Court in 1994. He was the acting chief justice of Patna High Court for brief periods in 2008 and 2009. He took oath as the Chief Justice of Allahabad High Court on 20th March 2009 and was elevated as a Judge Supreme Court of India on 8 February 2010, from where he superannuated on 14 July 2014. Thereafter, he was appointed Chairman of the Press Council of India. Justice Prasad has a legacy that makes all Patna High Court lawyers proud. Arnesh Kumar versus State of Bihar, which is the misuse of 498 AIP, uh, IPC case, Vishwalochan Madan versus Union of India, the Fatwa case, Mohammad Ajmal Amir Kasab versus State of Maharashtra, Nandalal Badwaik versus Lata Nandalal Badwaik, and another are few judgments spent by him that will dominate legal discussions for, for some time to come. He has edited the 22nd edition of the Classic Criminal Law Textbook by Ratan Lal Dhiraj Lal. He has also edited Mullah's book on CPC. Personally speaking, I have seen Honorable Justice C.K. Prashad as a crusader of the rule of law, and when builders were getting away with brazen violation of building norms, he put his foot down and made them accountable for their sins. He would not countenance a culture of impunity, but sought to foster an environment of accountability and establishing the rule of law in the area of building bylaws. I now call upon a worthy disciple of a worthy guru to share with us the life persona and the aura of the great personality that Thakur Babu was. Over to you, sir. Mr. Jamsankar Prasad, the Minister of Law and Justice, Electronics and Information Technology and Communications. My Lord, the Chief Justice of Patna I Court Justice Sanjay Karol, Justice S. S. Jha, Justice Anant Vijay Singh, Mr. Asok Chavara, Dr. Mod Vijay Chand, and distinguished guest. Thank you very much, Dr. Chandra, for the nice words you have spoken about me. I am grateful to Atmoth for inviting me to talk about a person who paved my destiny. I remember my senior, Mr. Thakur Prasad, as a person who was not only an accomplished lawyer and a successful politician, but also as a loving and concerned senior. I will be ever grateful to him for the lessons of law and life which he gave to me, I cherish those lessons ever today. My joining the chamber was more by luck than design. The first exercise which every law graduate intending to join the profession does is to look for a senior. The task is very difficult, particularly for a first generation lawyer. This was also true with me. As a student, I was greatly impressed by one of the eminent teachers of the law college, Mr. Uday Sena, and I was particularly impressed by his punctuality, discipline, and learning. And therefore, he was my first choice. Armed with a law degree in my hand, I went to his Kadam Kumar residence. He was very nice and polite. And when I disclosed the purpose of my visit, he said that it would not be advisable for me to join his chamber. I was disheartened and did not understand the reason for his refusal. I was reasonably a good and a disciplined student and his refusal upset me. After a couple of months, he was sworn in as a judge of the Patna High Court. And then I realized the reason for his refusal. In this way, my first mission failed. And thereafter, 
the search for another senior started on a reference by a very distinguished homeopathic practitioner of the city dr d c kern i along with my father went to meet mr thakur prasad at his pir mohani residence it was a winter morning and we found a handsome person sitting in a chamber impeccably dressed glancing through a brief we were allowed to come in the chamber and my father gave the reference and disclosed the purpose of our visit he listened to him and took a piece of paper from his drawer and gave that to me thereafter he dictated for a few minutes and and i took it very diligently and handed over to him what i had written at that time it did i did not understand at all the contents thereof but later on found that it was the format in which the petitions are filed in the court he went through that and looked satisfied he was happy with the speed and the clarity of my writing this is how i passed the first examination and i was allowed to join his chamber i can talk about him for hours and hours together but, but because of the limited time i would say only those qualities of that senior advocate which impressed me the most he was very hard working and his office hours usually from 8 o'clock to 9:30 in the morning and 7 o'clock to 10:30 in the evening but on many occasions the work continued till 12 o'clock in the night and in those days he used to have dinner with and i had the privilege to have that on many occasions he was a professional 24/7 it was not for the purpose of pleasure for money but his belief that lawyers must take into account the convenience of the litigants and never keep them waiting during those days successful lawyers used to take the services of stenographers my senior mr thakur prasad was not amongst them he used to dictate the writ petitions the bail applications or the memo of appeal to juniors and at that time it looked disgusting to me and thought it to be sheer waste of time however with the passage of time i realized that this was the best part of my training when you write in long hand you know the facts of the case and the question of law involved therein and that it sticks to you all through your life the legal fraternity remembers him as a successful lawyer some as an accomplished civil lawyer whereas many as a very competent criminal lawyer i remember him as a versatile lawyer who knew the intricacies of law both civil and criminal you may be surprised to know that he was considered as a great civil lawyer to the litigants in the then district of champaran and criminal lawyer for those who belong to the old district of saran this gave us the occasion to understand the intricacies of both the civil and the criminal law he valued liberty and represented a large number of detainees including his son the present law minister of india arrested under the maintenance of internal security act he never charged any professional fee from the detainees he represented i have i had never seen mr thakur prasad in his chamber casually dressed and he did not like any one of his juniors to be so in my early days once i attended the chamber wearing a round neck t-shirt that too with a logo a smile printed on it he was visibly annoyed but did not say anything in the presence of the clients but when i was alone he emphasized that lawyers should not only dress and conduct themselves properly in court but outside also this lesson is relevant to me even today his preparation in the case was a treat to watch unlike bhula bhai desai who trusted his memory 
and never made a single note throughout his career as a lawyer, my senior believed in taking exhaustive notes. He belonged to the school of legendary P.R. Das, and, is, and it is widely known that P.R. Das notes used to start with, may it please your Lord saves, and end with these are my submissions. His parameters for judging lawyers were entirely different. According to him, it is not the money and the number of briefs make a lawyer a successful lawyer. His observation was that even successful lawyers have lived pathetic life on retirement, maybe on the ground of illness or age. And therefore he considered only those lawyers successful who have saved for those contingency. I vividly remember a conversation which I had with him when I was hardly 28. And the topic of conversation was as to the amount I would need for a decent living at the age of 60. I found the subject very odd and boring, but I disclosed that a sum of rupees 25,000 a month would be good enough. One may laugh at it today, but I put that sum thinking that to be on the higher side. That was the end of the conversation. After a few weeks, my senior hands over to me a passbook of a PPF account which sold a deposit of the piece 500 and he advised me to make regular deposits on that account. He was of the opinion that every lawyer must save for the rainy days. He was not only a versatile lawyer, but also a distinguished politician. He was the president of the Bharatiya Jan Sangh for decades. He was a member of the Bihar Legislative Assembly and also a minister in the state cup cabinet. But one thing perhaps one may not believe is that he kept his political and professional life absolutely separate and never mixed the two at any point of time. He did not like the politicians intruding in the chamber which I was occupying then when he was the minister. He desired that professionals must join one or the other political party of their choice for good of the country, with a caveat that only successful lawyers can contribute better to the party. The, he was a political leader, but never influenced any of the juniors to join the party to which he belonged. This is really extraordinary. He was a man of great principles and followed what he preached. Many of you might be knowing that the political party to which he belonged believed that the missionary school indulged in conversion. And despite the fact that the level of education of these missionary schools were better, he never allowed his children to go to those schools. And I share the secret with you Mr. Ravi Sankar Prasad, the distinguished law minister of India, was greatly agreed by that. During those days, the students coming out of mystery schools used to be fluent in English, and that perhaps was the reason that Ravi wanted to go to the mystery school. Thank God, Mr. Thakur Prasad did not sacrifice his principles. And with the passage of time, we see that Mr. Ravi Sankar Prasad has blossomed into a successful and powerful speaker, not only in his mother tongue, but English also. During the last leg of his life, Mr. Thakur Prasad was greatly disturbed by the rise of casteism, not only amongst the political leaders, but in courts also. He hated the selection of seniors on caste lines. I do not remember any incident in any court that he fought with the judge. He respected the judge of all levels and never liked anybody criticizing them. He never liked litigants or for that matter lawyers attributing motive to the judges for the view they had taken. He appreciated criticism of the judgment, but not the judge. He would have been absolutely unhappy today when we see that instead of judgment being assailed, judges are 
maligned. He ought to have said to the world the difference between alochana or another. Alochana kare, another na kare. I again thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, Your Lordship, for the inspiring glimpse into the life of Thakur Babu, a professional who is worth emulating in every respect. Next to speak is Honorable Mr. Justice Anant Vijay Singh, former judge, Sharkhand High Court, and currently the chair, the uh, member judicial of National Company Law Appellate Tribunal. Honorable Mr. Justice Anant Vijay Singh joined Patna High Court in the chamber of Sri Rana Pratap Singh, senior advocate. He practiced in Patna High Court on civil, criminal, and constitution side. He joined the Superior Judicial Services in 1997. In the year 2003, he was promoted as the principal district judge. He worked as Director Judicial Academy of Jharkhand for a long time and successfully completed the UNDP research project on access to justice under the aegis of National Judicial Academy, Bhopal, in the year 2008. He established first video conferencing court in India and conducted three sessions trial through video conferencing at, as a pilot project. He was elevated to the Honorable Court, High Court of Jharkhand on 11th April 2016. Justice Anant Vijay Singh also guided and completed a research project relating to cybercrime in the state of Jharkhand. He was appointed as judicial member in National Company Law Appellate Tribunal New Delhi on 21 1 2020. I came in close contact with him when I was reading for my PhD in London on access to justice and his lordship was executing the project on access to justice then. We exchanged views. He sought my comments on the draft. I do not know how helpful my comments were to him, but the exercise was useful to me in testing my own thesis. From this experience, I can tell you that he is an excellent researcher. And like any good researcher, he is a voracious reader. When I went to his residential office to invite him for a workshop on right to privacy in Ranchi, I saw in his library books that were very recently released. Seeing the astonishment, he told me that the e-commerce platforms have made knowledge more accessible. Even very recently, I saw a post of him holding a book on virtual courts by Richard Suskin. The book, based on the European experience with e-courts, I was released in Harvard during the lockdown period. He has perhaps devoured it already. He is very engaged on social media and mostly encouraging you to read and consume more knowledge like him. I'm informed that he is also a very supportive senior colleague. It is only befitting that today we have Honorable Justice Singh to speak to us in the memory of late Thakur Prashad another erudite scholar and senior advocate of Patna High Court. I request Honorable Mr. Justice Anand Vijay Singh to deliver his special address. Thank you, Dr. Moria, for kind words. For your kind words, the topic you assigned to me is a very vast topic and a very abstract one. After paying my homage to Dr. Thakur Prashad, I will talk about data, data privacy, data security, and data security in context of our judiciary, because we are also a last consumer and producer of the data, how things are moved. And whatever about data I have learned is I am keen follower of the Honorable Law Minister on his YouTube and Facebook and other social media. And at least twice in a month, he's in a seminar as IT minister, giving new ideas about it. Only this week, there was a Google Meet, sixth Google Meet, where he gave a very powerful message for digitalization and the more and more creation of the apps and other things. And the, the last week, he opened one data center by Hira Channani and gave a good message. And from there, we get the clue and we start researching the age of internet and then we learn 
So basically, a self learning, learning process, and we have quite quite the knowledge. Now we're working back to my little association with late Sri Thakur Shah. We are resident by same Mahla. We are the voter of Thakur Shah, and we have seen him as a legislator and a minister, and his contribution in building of state of Bihar. While when joined the profession. I was a member of the Barrister Association where late Sri Thakur Prasad was the president, when then the president. And he was a keen observer of contemporary events. And I was assigned a duty every day. At that time, there was no social media and other things. So one has to rely on the newspaper and to brief him. Every day at 3 30, I used to brief on national and international and local news the events in a neutral manner. That's how the association grew. And through oral traditions, we learned many things. He discussed about the first case, the Patna High Court, the hard land reforms Act, how it was struck down, and how PR Das was piloting at that time only. Only the barrister used to stay and sit in barrister association. Sir used to be in advocate to sessions to come. And I've also seen him hearing in court number 16, defending the action of the state of Bihar when the land development back due to mismanagement of the affairs of the bank was dissolved and the state was appointed. Saying this thing, now this first amendment and this land reforms act, Bihar land reforms act case have again have come into prominence these days with one new book which has come written by Tri Ripu Daman Singh. That relates to, and that, that is name and style as 16 stormy days. And the, we may recall that when the constitution came into 15 January 15, there was only one year, and the provisional constituent assembly was the, assembly, the first Lok Sabha. The election was due in 1952. In between, Land Reforms Act was enacted in state of Bihar that was struck down. At the same time, same time, the crossroad and seminar magazines were prohibited for circulation by the Madras High Court and the reservation to the socioeconomic group on the basis of caste was all struck down. That led to First Amendment. And at that time, I could recall Sir used to discuss the role of Sam, late Sama Prashad Mukherjee. Dr. Sama Prashad Mukherjee was the then leader of the nation, the founder of the Bharatiya Janata Party. These all matters find reference in this book. And how these things, after reading through this book, I remember and the, the, the narration of that great man and my pay my homage to him, to him. And now coming to the subject. Patna is Patna High Court is pioneer in many things. The first computation in India when nobody even has heard of the things, the affairs of the judiciary can be computerized. In 1992, printing of court list was a great problem. So Justice Bharuka had taken over as a judge, and he, with the support of the then Chief Justice Basar, only requested to have one initial computer. And with two assistants, he started preparing the call list. And he used to be very curious and used to go and after doing his work, and he used to go and see him what he's doing. Anyhow, the thing started. In meanwhile, I got in service, and after some time, I was a local Jharkan cadre. At that point of time, computation of the course had started, but it was not a cent under central sponsored scheme. It was under an initiative of the High Court supported by the state government. But the High Court have traveled some, time, some distance in meanwhile, this is Baruka was completed this project of compression, not of the district courts, but High Court also. So in 2003, when Chief Justice was Justice VK Gupta, he sent me to training there and we came back and started 
on, on Bangor pattern, we started computation, the PS section and administrative side of it. This central sponsor scheme came in year 2006 and 7 based on Tihar model. Tihar was the first cotton delivery to become. And things started rolling down. Simultaneously, there was some development, fast development in the technology. We remember that at that point only the spectrum and the 2G was only available. So that only can internet has come. 99 internet has come in India, but speed was so slow. Only at 2G, only the data could be transferred. Gradually, when the time rolled out, 3G came. 3G came, when 3G came, spectrum was allotted and they came, it came. It, it allowed not only the audio, but the video to be transferred. So things started rolling and the scheme computation also was enlarged. And by 2013-14, the central government, I mean, to Minister of Justice, have allotted a lot of time, uh, funds. The committee and the Supreme Court was also constituted. And under the sec first, second phase, the, all district courts uh, to local area network was connected, were decided to digitalize the records and also establish e courts basically for production of the accused persons, because it took a lot of time and was to put pressure. So in 2014, the first e-court, the judge in charge computer in Jharkhand High Court, but then Justice D.N. Patel, now Chief Justice of the High Court. And my Lord Justice Madan Lukur was the chairman of the e-court committee of Supreme Court. So it was decided to have a pilot basis e court established in Jharkhand. Ranchi it was established in 2014 November and simultaneously five other courts were established. Then it was decided in between 4G have already arrived, things have improved, speed of internet have improved. So it was decided to hold a That was to see ki how, if the trial is conducted successfully, how the data and the reports is to be restored. So, we, because we can't have the physical data and also the data on the restored in, in, in the particular center. These were the things that cloud, cloud computing technology have not come at that point of time. So, we decided, but Matter was referred to Supreme Court. Supreme Court was also not in position to take a decision because difference of opinion among the judges. Some were supporting, some were not supporting. Anyhow, bus and the things was not moving. Although computerization have 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 taken place, but the dislation of the entire records of the High Court and District Court and the 14 Finance Commission only was not being taken. It's very slow. So we must give some credit to this COVID epidemic. So this had triggered off because at that point in time, the large majority of the honorable judges, the advocates, they were of the view that legislation can only be taken support for the ministerial work and not for the court work. Online courts were unheard of, people were resisting it. So, but of this, this opportunity has been given and we are now moving to that direction and things are moving because of this COVID. And technology have also improved. Now coming, reverting back to this section of data and data fluminity, because of large scale digitalization, started from issuing about Harka, then Hanyos, and other things. We created large number of data. And the question remained, went to who owns this data? And what if, person who is generating data is the author, author or owner of data or some other person, the service provider is data. The most of the service provider, you know, they don't have their server here because we don't have the log. So it has to be stored somewhere outside this country. And that created a lot of problems. At the same time, there was a rise of cyber crime and that led to taking up this research project, which was sponsored by 
the Ministry of Law and Justice because Jharkhand have become one of the area where a lot of cyber crime have started taking place. And the Netflix, you may see one short film also on this name as Jamtara, where they have described exactly how this takes place. So while researching that project, we that is an actionable project how the law functions. So the only law was at that point of time was IT law, Information Technology Act. But that act basically was meant for for promoting the e-commerce trade and not containing the, the, the crime. Same security, it was 2000, it was amended, some penal offenses were made, but things are not as, not you know, there is no deterrence on it and things are moving in, in, in a faster and more of new crimes are coming to this because of data is so much available in, easily in the, in the, in the, in the cyber world. Taking this, at the same time, because of this, the one Justice Sri Krishna Committee was constituted for data protection. They have given the report, a huge report that came same at the same time. The right to privacy judgment also was delivered by Constitution Bench. Now, this honorable minister has introduced that bill of data protection. Another thing that you shall refer to select committee. We hope that will be passed to. In the today's new, newspaper Times of India, yesterday there was a meeting of the select committee because of lack of current cannot be taken. Well, but these are the subjects which is emerging very fast. Now, my, my Lord Justice Session have mentioned about the fact that the data persons use it to you part with the data. To you, if you open a bank account, you give certain information that's sought for and you give that data to them. And that can be used in various ways. That is there. Then how it will be claimed if that is used, suppose you give it the data. One of the questions before the committee is, suppose the data of opening a bank account is given, that much information opening a bank account is used. But some other players come, say the, there are some institutions which are in advancing finance for bank and for car or for the housing, and they use your data, whether without your permission, it can be holded over to the third party or not. Our question has been this, and, it, and parting of the data has been sought to be defended on the ground that once you have given the data to an institution, that data becomes institutional data and they can part with it. So this will give a lot of, because of privacy judgment and other things, a lot of new litigations will be coming. But I'm sorry to say none of our law college are now heading towards that and designing a course. Forget about this thing. Even they don't have any of the law college except the issue of corporate affairs. Have one regular diploma course in IBC code and other things. None of the code had that. People are not knowing things. I am saying like this because the two weeks before, I'm only back. The switch and the truth inaugurated the online session and three apps by the Kerala High Court. I have a reason to witness that program. The Kerala High Court have developed three particular apps, one pertaining to bail matters, one pertaining to motor vehicle matter, and one pertaining to land mission matters. All these matters now will be filed three mode and it will be circulated to all the stakeholders. Say bail matters. Now simultaneously we have computation of all of our police stations. No sooner a bail application three mode is filed, copy will be sent to the police station, the superintendent of police, the public prosecutors. In case there are other things, they will be sending it. So there is so this will become paperless and thing will will move in a fast speed. So this COVID, I am telling this is, Patna High Court is again in forefront when courts came to stand still. So that was the first court which all the animal judges were holding court through virtual months. And all the judgments, they, they have created a separate file where the cases during file during the COVID, 
are been listed and the orders are been listed also so by scooping that orders you can come to you can analyze and you can see the five minutes data are now available you can analyze and scan you can see what nature of cases are coming for the court 40% cases are pertaining to bail application out of which there is a rough estimate which i have done it. out of which 25% is to only one act that is excise act so how to deal with this data which you are getting is not for other so you have to mine it and with the advent of artificial and other things you can evolve policy so we can save the time of the courts and other things these are some of the views i wanted to share and again thank you for giving my uh, giving you this opportunity to share my views and again paying my respect to let me then see thakur to shah i in conclude my speech and sign off thank you thank you your worship for uh, this excellent sharing of views Our next next speaker is Honorable Mr. Justice Sanjay Karol, Chief Justice of Patna High Court. Honorable Mr. Justice Sanjay Karol belongs to village Garli in Kangra district of Himachal Pradesh. Garli is the first heritage village in India. He graduated with history honors from Government College, Sanjali. Justice Karol obtained law degree from Himachal Pradesh University, and in 1983 he was enrolled as an advocate, practiced in various courts, including Supreme Court. he was on the senior panel of the government of india in the supreme court he was the advocate general of himachal pradesh from 1998 to 2003 he was designated as a senior advocate in the year 1999 he was appointed as an additional judge of the himachal pradesh high court in 2007 and also served as the acting chief justice of the high court from 25th april 2017 justice karol became the fourth chief justice of tripura high court on 14 november 2018 he was transferred as chief justice of patna high court on 11th november 2019 justice karol is a very warm personality but means business he works undeterred by immediate barriers and has his sight set on the long term vision his disposal records and the implementation of icct in the courts within the jurisdiction of patna high court is unparalleled he is a compassionate human being and can as can be gathered from the fact that he distributed the lychees grown in his official garden to the needy and deserving in patna during lockdown the joy it brought on the faces who received the gift from the chief justice of their state was reward- rewarding for all of us however what mesmerizes me most about him is his hunger for more in building the institution of the high court when i went to inform him about atmod's conference on criminal law in december 2019 and mentioned that we were expecting participation of about 100 lawyers he quipped daily footfall of lawyers in patna high court is 4000 only 100 are interested this gave me a sense of his vision he would rightly expect more lawyers to be participating in continuous learning he has we have taken that suggestion we have relentlessly pursued the path of continued learning the numbers may not be as great yet but it is growing since march 25th more than 200 lawyers have experienced a simulated paperless court environment and from amongst them 12 lawyers of patna high court are now in a position to train others in this we are now ready to mass train lawyers of the state we would like to begin with training all the legal aid lawyers if possible i now call upon the head of the institution that eminent late thakur prasad belong to honorable mr justice San- sanjay karol to deliver his special address over to you sir श्री रवि शंकर प्रसाद जी श्री जय सिंह जी जस्टिस चंद्रमौली कुमार प्रसाद जी जस्टिस प्रसिंह झा श्री अशोक डॉक्टर मौर्य वेरी गुड इवनिंग टू ऑल ऑफ यू माय ब्रदर जजेस कोलीग्स लेडीज एंड जेंटलमैन and i must thank the organizers for inviting me for uh, today's webinar i'm indeed humbled and privileged to deliver a special address for this memorial lecture in honor of uh, great soul late 
श्री ठाकुर सोशल वर्कर एट हार्ट एंड ब्रिलियंट लीगल माइंड He did not limit his intellectual pursuits to the comfort of a thriving legal practice, but chose to use his immense talent as a social worker and thinker for the people of Bihar. It is indeed heartening to note his legacy being carried forward by his progeny with greater vigor and. him on this occasion past 25 years of his life in the 100th year of his birth anniversary is itself a great tribute to the legendary figure i ask myself who doesn't know thakur babu and who would not want to emulate him such was the legendary soul still lives in the presence of the high court with us my greetings and felicitations to the family members coming to the subject is close to the heart of uh, today's special speaker the honorable minister who is an authority in himself to so express views the same technology is expanding on an exponential curve and has become inseparable from human existence digital inclusion is a sign for none for the progress in this era without which we run the risk of breeding a stratified and unequal society going digital means more than just using digital tools is about making sure everyone notab no notability to use technology seamlessly but also ensuring that its use is safe secure and protected from misuse emerging technologies hold tremendous promise at the same time they are rife with troubling uncertainties privacy concerns of individuals are at the heart the law and technology debate and therefore a balance needs to be struck between the benefits of technology and privacy violations that ensure from its misuse over 19 pandemic has expedited the overnight shift of the paper towers of public offices onto web based platforms this stands true for the indian judiciary that has despite its multiple challenges kept the wheels of justice turning honorable minister honorable judges my panelists who have seen the glory of this great court i must share it with you that uh, what uh, honorable justice jha mentioned the system which was here was put to test during this time in december 2019 we introduced a system for mentioning matters for early listing the patna high court in this system if a digital copy in the form of pen drive or cd were to be filed along with the physical file matter would be listed for hearing in 24 hours till march this year we only had three such filings however since then we saw an exponential growth in the number of filings with a hit of approximately 10000 e files additionally the honorable judges of this court and the learned advocates have themselves achieved a remarkable feat by embracing remote work and taking up 20000 files and disposing of more than 12000 files and all this through the mode of video conference honorable minister what is important is not the number i must compliment all my brother colleagues the mar and everyone involved in the system what is important is that there's a phenomenal transformation of the human mindset 
since the lockdown, the unlockdown, and the lockdown, there's never been a single day when we have not sat in the court and we have kept the doors of access to justice open all the time for everyone. Across professions, technology has kept us supplied, connected, and informed during this pandemic, and we have suddenly become reliant on services that allow us to work and learn from home. The BharatNet project, which is the world's largest government-backed rural broadband connectivity program, has witnessed a significant increase in data consumption across the country. As per the latest figures, April quarter, the data consumption across the country was approximately 5 lakh gigabyte, as compared to 2.47 in January, March. Overall data consumption spiked in rural areas of Bihar, Jharkhand, and Uttar Pradesh, where the highest number of migrants and blue collar workers returned from big cities following the national lockdown. As per one report, India's active, active internet user base is expected to hit approximately 600 million by the end of December this year, largely propelled by rural India, which has registered approximately 45% growth in internet penetration. All of these impressive figures indicate that, they are, that we are makers, users, and consumers of technology in a manner which represents a seismic shift in the way that economic, political, and social value is being created, exchanged, and distributed. At a more granular level, any individual in India's remotest corner uses and interacts with technology and the internet on a regular basis. The ordinary citizen trusts an electronic voting machine to keep her vote confidential and secure from tampering. She carries a digital identification card to access food rations and uses a mobile phone to make cashless payments with the aid of UPI. And she uses a computer to gather with her classmates and teachers who are based around the country to recreate physical classroom virtual. With the successful implementation of the World Bank funded project in Bihar, the farmers have benefited by obtaining relevant information relating to weather alerts, crop diseases, farming societies, and online markets on their mobile phones. Even during the pandemic, the Bihar government, and I'm sure this is true to the central government and all other governments across the country, facilitated monetary aid of approximately 200 crores to more than 29 lakh migrants who returned back to the state. Increased reliance on the use of social media, mobile phones, wearable devices, tracking devices by urban users have made aspects of our personal lives increasingly accessible to other parties. Business models are structured around walking, allowing websites to collect, manage, and modify individual web traffic to further shape individual choices and preferences. At some point, all of us have been victims of targeted ads and often wonder how our phone pops up with attractive flight hotel offers right after one has a conversation about a holiday. An average internet user has no control or clarity of where most personal data goes and what entity, uh, entities decide to do with it. Honorable Justice Jha just mentioned, gave an illustration of the WhatsApp, which he had received. The pervasiveness of technology has also exposed vulnerabilities, arms, and challenges, such as hacking, snooping, online harassment, spread of misinformation, and leakage of sensitive data. The problem arises when technology changes exponentially, but social, economic, and legal systems change incrementally. At the heart of the law and technology debate lies the privacy concerns of individuals. 
The following challenges rise, raise questions for lawmakers and courts in relation to constitutional values of privacy and autonomy of individuals. One, non-consensual surveillance. Two, non-consensual collection of private data and its commodification to shape individual choices and opinions. And three, ineffectual means of fasting liability on individuals responsible for misusing personal information. Privacy is a complex and constantly evolving issue. Without doubt, privacy has become a universal and generalized concept which requires legal commitment and protection. While our current privacy debate might feel new, it's a constitution it's a continuation of a conversation that has been going on for decades. In an article titled as Right to Privacy, written by Samuel Warren and uh, the eventual judge, Robin Hood of Law, Louis Brandes, in the 19th century, expressed the concerns over unauthorized circulation of information and discussed the right to be let alone as a manifestation of an in violate personality, a uh, core of freedom and liberty, which had to be free from intrusion. Members of the Constituent Assembly also advocated for the right to privacy. I'm sure Honorable the Minister has read every debate. As an authority, he knows everything that was discussed there. As a fundamental right in the context of uh, inviolability of, the own, of one's home and effects against unreasonable searches and arrests. However, the Supreme Court recognized in the privacy judgment, the discussions of the framers of the Constitution did not reflect the full contours of the right to privacy, especially as they exist in a modern technologically structured society. To that end, the court recognized that the right to privacy is a constitutive component of the right to life and liberty. Privacy, correctly attaches to the individual person. It is what enables individuals to protect their beliefs, to develop their personalities, to form their personal relationships and associations. It is the constitutional value that allows a person to meaningfully exercise their right of autonomy, dignity, free expression and association. An individual's protected right to control her thoughts and personality extends naturally to control over her digital thoughts and personality. Data privacy, therefore, is a protected fundamental right. There cannot be any debate or discussion. Individual Indian institutions have made great strides in harnessing the potential of digital infrastructure. There is no doubt that effective governance in the modern age must involve digital technology, but digital governance must be accompanied by safeguards that reflect the enhanced rights of individuals. The Honorable Supreme Court in Aadhaar judgment applied the four test, four stage test of proportionality that any state action must satisfy. First, state action must have a legitimate goal. Second, there must be a, reaction, a rational nexus between the state action and the goal the state seeks to achieve. Third, the state action should be necessary and there should be no other means that is equally effective but less restrictive of rights. And fourthly, the policy should not have a disproportionate impact on a person's fundamental rights. And if I may add, that is what the Lordship have also said, that national interest prevails upon individual interest. These are essential standards that must inform every policy and legislative measures towards data security and data privacy. This may be an ambitious idea in a country where despite steady improvements, digital literacy remains uneven. But the history of India as a modern republic shows that we have not shied away from the ambitious idea. And as the First 12 speakers have said that Honorable the Minister has already seized with the bill. I'm sure all this would be considered and taken note. The drafters of a constitution committed 
to universal adult franchise protections against discrimination and the equality and dignity of all individuals in the largely illiterate and deeply divided, deeply radical society. Commitment to data privacy and robust data security is in harmony with the transformative and forward-looking spirit of India's constitutional foundations. Digital technologies fuel innovation, efficiency, and inclusion, and are foundational in ideas forward march towards becoming a global economic powerhouse. And that is what Honorable the Speaker, the Honorable the Minister, has in speaking in all the platforms. Modern governance is marked by a creation of digital ecosystems that include the collection of names, nationality, address, family, gender, caste, and fingerprints of individuals. By classifying, codifying, and standardizing this cloud of information, the government strives to increase the efficiency, uh, efficiency sorry, of social welfare programs. However, at the ground level, such classification in itself may act as a paradox and an impediment in access to basic needs. For example, once an individual has disclosed his information regarding his religion or caste, she may be discriminated and denied access to basic facilities such as health care. We did have one such example in the recent past. An electricity connection, a bank account, or even a job application. This raises and legal issues and places focus on whether state and non-state actors are well equipped with security measures to protect individuals' data. With the increase of privatization, non-state functionaries are entering uncharted territories that are previously within the exclusive state domain. PISA is a good example of which Justice Jagya. Recognition and enforcement of claims of privacy for non-state actors may require legislative intervention at the earliest. Should have the owners of safeguarding their consumers against malwares and bulk data collection. Consumers of technologies should have the right to determine for themselves when, how of them is used and communicated to others. Private actors must adopt best practices and standards and use feedback mechanisms to discuss and address privacy-related issues presented by emerging technologies. With the delivery of government services via digital media, and complete digital dependence, it is imperative that digital divide between the haves and the have-nots is abridged. Technology should not create a digital divide and must act as a great unifier. Despite extensive discussions around possible misuse and concerns revolving around data privacy, somehow all of us do not seem to be deterred by our vulnerability. At this point, one must pause and question, why is it? The answer to the question is two point, as per my view. First, the increase in internet penetration, uh, penetration must be uh, accompanied by a digital literacy. Users of the internet who primarily lie in rural areas must be made aware of their rights and remedies and law to prevent harm from the misuse of their individual data. I'm not quite sure a person living in Darbanga, in the remotest corner, even knows about all these concepts. They have to be sensitized, they have to be informed and appraised of such rights. Which onus, of course, lies with us. Secondly, is the inability of legislators to fasten liability and hold perpetrators accountable for breaching individuals' privacy? Technology has outpaced the lawmakers and now judges who may not be best suited, have been tasked with the responsibility of regulating how technology interacts with the citizenry. David Pollenrich, in his book, Social Control of Technology, discusses the dilemma of technology regulation and notes. When change is easy, the need for it cannot be foreseen. And when the need for change is apparent, change has become expensive, difficult, and time-consuming. Therefore, 
the need of the R is to have a multi task holder discussions and have in place timely yet extensive statutory mechanisms that are worded in common parlance and are easily comprehensible by the masses. All of us are going to play a crucial role in upholding privacy and individual autonomy of Indian citizens. This will ensure that the privacy does not remain mischaracterized as a luxury good, but becomes a right of the masses. With these words, I take you here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lordship, for the illuminating address. And uh, what we take from uh, this address uh, for uh, us is that there is a need for uh, a sustained campaign on cyber hygiene, uh, which we will try to uh, try to implement. It is now time uh, for the keynote address by uh, Sri Ravi Shankar Prashad, Honorable Minister of Law and Justice and Communications and Information Technology. He needs no introduction to this audience. He is an illustrious son of uh, an illustrious father. Thakur Babu must have been very proud of him. For any father, the proudest moment is when he is known better by the name of his son. One cannot doubt that Sri Ravi Shankar Prashad ji has attained that feat. As a young lawyer in Patna High Court, when I first saw Sri Ravi Shankar Prasad during lunchtime on the corner table in the Barristers Association, he appeared a daunting and an inaccessible person. Perhaps the aura of Barristers Association of the time was such that at, at the time and the table uh, uh, that uh, that uh, uh, Sri Ravi Shankar Prashadji used to uh, sit on and uh, occupy uh, was, uh, was a very, very powerful table and has given many judges and successful politicians. However, when I went to meet him, in his residential chamber to explore the possibility of speaking to young lawyers to build capacity to carry out legal aid work in jail, he came out as very accessible and readily agreed. He talked to me at length. It's another matter that Jharkhand was created and I moved to Jharkhand High Court after that and the workshop didn't happen. Incidentally, it was on that occasion that I came to know that Sri Ravi Shankar Prasadji was Thakur Babu's son by the nameplate outside in the house of Ravi Shankar Prasadji uh, on a white marble, uh, the name of Thakur Babu was written. I have watched with awe the arguments of Sri Ravi Shankar Prasadji in order scam case and also in the Supreme Court. He is an excellent communicator. However, it was sheer joy to listen to his erudite speech on net neutrality and data sovereignty in an Observer Research Foundation event. His command over this evolving subject area at the global level has been etched in my mind ever since. As a cabinet minister, as we all know, he's the spokesperson of the government. He is a widely traveled man and has represented India in various international conferences and the UN. As a minister, he has already created a legacy that will be difficult to match in times to come. Digital India is an immense success. India is the hub of IT-enabled services and fast becoming an important center of electronic manufacturing. Telecom sector, though struggling a little at the moment, is poised to contribute the lion's share in the $5 trillion economy that India will soon grow into. I will not stand between him and the audience anymore and now request Sri Ravi Shankar Prashadji to deliver the keynote address. Over to you, sir. Honorable Justice Sanjay Kiral, Chief Justice of Patna High Court, Retired uh, Supreme Court Judge Justice C.K. Prasad, former Chief Justice Shri Sinjaji, my good friend Anand Vijay, now a distinguished member of the NPLT, he to sit by my side. Shashok Chabra and Maria Vijay Chandra, thank you for the kind words. When Mason Jha Saab ne mujhe phone kerke kaha ki mere pita ji ke naam par Atma Bodh ek mubari lecture karai ki, thoda mujhe aashare hua. So mujhe baat prasanta hoi ki jo unho ne bataya ki patna hai koot ke tamam bade vajinho ke naam par Shri Nath Singh pita ji ke dost the 
किशोर बाबू प्रभा शंकर मिश्रा जी ये कड़ी उनकी अगुवाई में आरंभ हुई है आत्मबोध ने किया है तो मैंने स्वीकार कर लिया फिर उन्होंने कहा कि आप कुछ बोलिए तो सामान्यतः मैं पिताजी के ऊपर क्या खुद बोलू फिर उन्होंने कुछ विषय कहा था कि मैं कंटेम्प्रेरी विषय डेटा प्राइवेसी का इस पर चर्चा करूंगा पिताजी के बारे में बहुत सी बातें कही गई मुझे अब उसको दोहराने की आवश्यकता नहीं है आप सबों ने बड़ी सार्थक और बड़ी भावुक करने वाली टिप्पणियां की हैं तो मैं आप सबों को हृदय से उनके पुत्र के रूप में धन्यवाद देता हूं मैं तीन बातें कहूंगा पिताजी के बारे में कि वो ट्रूली सेल्फ मेड मैन अगर सेल्फ मेड मैन का कॉपीराइट डिस्क्रिप्शन चाहिए तो लुक टूवर्ड्स ठाकुर के साथ हम लोग बहुत ही सिंपल परिवार में जन्मे थे कोई अफ्लुएंस नहीं था जस्ट ऑर्डनरी अभी कहा गया कि वो इंडियन नेशन में सब लीडर बने मैंने एक बार उनसे पूछा था ना इसलिए कि बकाना शुरू करना था तो कुछ कमाई भी तो होनी चाहिए तो ऑनेस्ट टेल मी और जब वो वकालत करते थे शुरू किया था तो आर एस का काम करते थे वो भी काम करते थे और साइकिल पर जाना सरजी बाबू क्या गदरी बाग से ये सब कहानियां बताई हैं बट ही ऑलवेज फॉलो इज प्रिंसिपल्स वेरी स्ट्रिक्ट और हम लोग को भी ये बताया गया और जूनियर्स के बारे में जैसे प्रसाद ने बहुत बातें कही हैं देखिए बहुत बड़ी बात है कि एक साधारण बैकग्राउंड से आकर के एक नामी वकील बनना और उसके बाद अपने चेंबर से ऐसे जूनियर्स को पैदा करना ट्रेन करना जो हाई कोर्ट के जज बने सुप्रीम कोर्ट के जज बने और आज उनके द्वारा ट्रेन एक जूनियर भारत का कानून मंत्री भी है लॉ मिनिस्टर आई थिंक इट इज समथिंग एक्स्ट्रॉडनरी ऑफ माई लेट फॉर द जूनियर्स ट्रेन बाय हिम रोज टू बिकम डिस्टिंग हाई कोर्ट जजेस सुप्रीम कोर्ट जजेस एमिनेंट लॉयर्स and one of them is a law minister this is a very i would say a great testimony of the way he used to teach his students agar aap unke social activism ko dekhein jo baat main kehna chahunga aur main kuch bahut log sun rahe hain desh bhar mein ki jansan ke founder member banna jisse uska koi bhavishya nahi usne desh mein ek badi party congress thi baaki socialist partiyan thi लेफ्टिस्ट पार्टियां थी तो कुछ लोग मजाक में कहते हुए थे आप कहां से आ गए भाई आपकी कौन सी पार्टी है अब उस समय उनके तक जाके पार्टी के अलग चला तो मुझे याद है कि विजय प्रसाद को याद है कि नहीं कि आ, मैंने जब से होश संभाला था जैसे संजय करोल आई नेवर सॉ द फेस ऑफ माय फादर ऑन वीकेंड टिल द सेवेंटीज बिकॉज यू टू टूर इन दर स्टेट पार्टी को खुला करके मैंने अटल बिहारी वाजपेयी और पिताजी को रिक्शा पर चलते हुए देखा एक बार गाड़ी खराब हो गई थी वो यात्रा वहां से शुरू हुई और आज वो पार्टी देश की सबसे बड़ी पार्टी बनी रूल करती है ये जो हार्ड वर्क है और देखिए आज के जमाने में एक विचारधारा में पैदा होना और उसी विचारधारा में रुखसत होना दुनिया से इट नीड्स हार्ड कमेंट और तीसरी बात मैं कहूंगा ने परिवार की भी चिंता की हमें पढ़ाया बेटियों को पढ़ाया बेटों को पढ़ाया शादी ठीक ठाक की और आज उनके ग्रैंड चिल्ड्रन भी अच्छा कर रहा है तो बिकमिंग एन एमिनेंट लॉयर हिमसेल्फ रेजिंग द पार्टी फ्रॉम द बिगिनिंग मेक इट एन इंपॉर्टेंट पार्टी इन द स्टेट एंड ऑल्सो टेकिंग केयर ऑफ द फैमिली इट टूक ऑल द थ्री इशूज टूगेदर इसलिए अगर मैं थोड़ा ऑब्जेक्टिव होकर पिताजी को देखने की कोशिश करूं तो तीनों क्षेत्रों में उन्होंने एक प्रकार से बड़ी ऊंचाई स्थापित की एक बात मैं बहुत से हमारे जजेस सुन रहे हैं वकील सुन रहे हैं उनको एक रोचक बात बताना चाहता हूं जरा सी के प्रसाद ने बताया मैं स्टूडेंट लाइफ में ही बड़ा एक्टिविस्ट हो गया था विद्यार्थी परिषद का जे मूवमेंट का जेल जाना वगैरह शुरू हो गया ये दस बारह साल चला फिर वकालत शुरू की उस समय उन्होंने 
मेरा एबीवीपी कभी धरना पर बैठा हूँ कभी मैं टूर पर बैठा हूँ चला गया हूँ केस खुल रहा है तो पिताजी ने क्लर्क से पूछा कि रवि बाबू कहाँ है तो कहा एबीवीपी के कार्यक्रम में गए तो वन डे कॉल्ड मी उन्होंने एक बात कही जो मैं अपने सारे जूनियर्स को बोलता हूँ का देखो अगर तुमको वही करना है तो बिकम ए फुल टाइम एक बात ध्यान रखना कि जितने योग्य वकील बनोगे उतनी अपने संगठन के लिए भी उपयोगी बात है अगर तुमको योग्य वकील बनना है तीन चार साल तक छोड़ना पड़ेगा एंड इज दिस लेसन आई टूक वेरी सीरियस पिताजी चौरानवे में गुजर गए स्क्रोल लेकिन मैंने अपने पिताजी के उस लेसन को दो बार याद किया जब मैंने फॉर्डरेस कैम में मेन केस बहस किया और सीबीआई इंक्वायरी एंड आई विश टू प्लेस ऑन रिकॉर्ड माय डीप अप्रिसिएशन ऑफ द कारेज शोन बाय जस्टिस एस एन झा द वे द थिंग्स वर मॉनिटर एंड आज उसमें जितने भी लोग थे नेता हो या ब्यूरोक्रेट्स हो सभी जिन में गए किसी को भी एक्विटल नहीं हुआ सप्लाय विटामिन स्कैम भी मैंने ही बहस किया पी आई एल और सीबीआई इंक्वायरी और दूसरी बात मुझे पिताजी का वो निर्देश याद आया जब मैं राम जन्मभूमि केस में इलाहाबाद हाईकोर्ट में लीड वकील बना फॉर द हिंदू एंड नॉट राम बना और जब वो केस हम जीते तो फिर जब मैं बाहर निकला तो मुझे पिताजी का वो निर्देश याद आया टूडे आई कुड जस्टिफाई लीगल ट्रेनिंग फॉर द कॉज ऑफ माई आइडियोलॉजी So this I always tell my young friends at the bar. Jitne yoga bhi, because there is. Or Pita ji ka ek aur the work ke thar kar sikhe ke saath bhula gaye. There is sikhe ke saath the great respect to him. There is no shortcut, but only hard work to succeed in the profession. So jitne tayar rahoge, to bhare naam par book ki naayega. Ek case acha bhas karoge, to apni kahin kaam chhod. तो ये बातें आज कुछ लगी कि मैं बोल दूं आज मैं एक बात और कहूंगा मेरी माता जी विमला प्रसाद इज नाउ 89 नाइन ईयर्स लड़ाई और पिताजी की यात्रा में सुख में दुख में उनकी भूमिका बदल गई आज के सब्जेक्ट पर क्या बोलू मैं आप लोगों ने इतना विद्युता पूर्वक जैसे स्क्रोल में जैसे जैसे झा ने बोला है और अनंत विजय ने मैं कुछ मोटी बातें कहना चाहता हूं एंड दट वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट यू मस्ट अंडरस्टैंड दिस डिजिटल वर्ल्ड द डिजिटल वर्ल्ड इज द वर्चुअल वर्ल्ड बट द प्रॉब्लम ऑफ डिजिटल वर्ल्ड इज फेस्ट इन द रियल वर्ल्ड एंड द एडवांटेजेस ऑफ द वर्चुअल वर्ल्ड इज ऑल्सो फेस्ट इन द रियल अब देखिए कोविड है हम आप बात कर रहे हैं अब जस्टिस ट्रोल ने एक चर्चा की तो मैं आपको बता दूं कि इस कोविड में हाई कोर्ट हैव कंडक्टेड वन लैख सेवेंटी फाइव थाउजेंड केसेस वर्चुअली वन लैख सेवेंटी फाइव थाउजेंड सबॉर्डिनेट कोर्ट हैव कंडक्टेड सेवन लैख थर्टी फोर थाउजेंड सिक्स हंड्रेड केसेस एंड सुप्रीम कोर्ट हैज डन सेवन थाउजेंड एट हंड्रेड केसेस तो अगर डिस्ट्रिक्ट कोर्ट भी सात लाख चौंतीस हजार छह सौ केसेस वर्चुअल किए तो एक बड़ी बात है डिजिटल पावर वर्चुअल पावर भी है लेट मी गिव द लार्ज नरेटिव इन रिलेशन टू द सब्जेक्ट आई एम कंटेन टू स्पीक आर प्राइम मिनिस्टर इज ए वेरी ट्रांसफॉर्मेटिव पर्सन हु अंडरस्टैंड द पावर I remember in the year 2014, when he was campaigning, he coined the word, "If I am elected as the Prime Minister, I would like to create an India where IT plus IT is equal to IT." What does it mean? IT information technology plus IT India's talent is equal to IT India tomorrow. That's the India which we have to create. But I never expected that he will give all the responsibility on my slippery shoulders to carry it forward. Digital India is a program which arose from there. What is digital India? You need to understand. Indian IT company have done exceedingly well in the IT services, from Infosys to 
uh, Wipro to many others. Indian IT companies are delivering services in 200 cities of 80 countries. They give billions of dollars of taxes in America. But Digital India is beyond that. Digital India is to empower ordinary Indians with the power of change. Number one. And number two, they scroll to bridge the digital divide. And number three, most important, bring in digital inclusion. Ek samaveshi digital bharat hai. What is the digital profile of India? Bharat ki abadi 130 crore, mobile phone 130 crore. Or Bharat mein smartphone saftar. What is a smartphone? A moving computers in your palm. Bharat mein aadhar card kitna hai? 126 crore. Internet is 68 crore. And if you take the mobile internet, 90% plus India is having internet. Now this digital profile, how we work for common good? We have bank account for which we call Chandan account, who had no access to bank. We link that with Aadhaar. What is Aadhaar? Aadhaar is a digital identity to supplement the physical identity. And the digital entity is based upon your iris and your fingerprint. You can change your name, but you cannot change your fingerprint and your iris. That is called core biometrics. So, we have a bank account to Jora Adhar, digital entity, mobile receipt. And then we started sending all the welfare measures to the bank account of the poor. The gas subsidy, the kirasan subsidy, the Russian subsidy, the Manrega menu. Now, I would like this esteemed audience to know in the last five and a half years, they have sent 11 lakh crore in the bank account of the poor. And we have saved 1 lakh 70,000 crore, which is to be pocketed by middlemen and fictitious cabinets. We have cut 8 crore fictitious gas cylinder. Ko cut kiya. Digital governance leads to good governance. You must know the positive side of it. Abhi jo COVID mein Pradhan Mantri ne 1,700,000 ka package announced kiya tha. We have sent 65,000 crore directly to the bank account of the poor. Aur humare postal vibhaag ko kaha ki jahaan par bank nahi hai, ATM nahi hai, wahan go with your mobile phone. Take the fingerprint and deliver the money. Close to 3,000 crores were distributed in the most inaccessible areas where there is no ATM or no bank branch. This is how you are able to deliver. Today, just to tell you one thing, we have hospitals for e hospital. Today, visa is e visa. 165 countries get e visa. E visa diya to bharat ka tourist sankhya bad gayi state mein. Today, lot of you will retire. There is a Jeevan Pramanam when I became minister in 2014. They said ki aap kuch karenge. We have to show every November we are alive before a bank to allow our pension to continue. Then came Jeevan Pramanam where you can digitally show that you are alive. E scholarship. Today, close to 5,000 crores have been distributed to nearly 2 crore students with the identification of Aadhaar. Fictitious recipient, gone. Kai jaga ne school mein Aadhaar ko lagaya, to tik jab hua to, khas ke ji Mumbai ka experience mein aapko batana chahunga ki wahan ek private school mein sara fund government deti hai, unke padne ka, boarding ka, dress ka. The number of students went down by 40 percent. counting The digital governance today, 21 crore farmers are having e soil health card whereby they can know the condition of their soil, fertility, sowing capacity. 
Now, how we are using data? One thing I would like to share with you, National Judicial Data Grid, which our NIC has made with the Supreme Court, we will tell you the number of it. Today, 13 crore 49 lakh 20,656 cases are on the National Judicial Data Grid, where 3 crore plus pending cases are there, and nearly 12.24 12, 12 crore orders, interim orders, and final judgments. But how I use it as a law minister? I'm able to identify district wise as to how many session trials are pending for more than 10 years. And I write to the High Court to just says, please see that they are expedited. So these are some of the positive aspects of technology and digital power, which you all need to know. Take the case of digital payment. India has become the biggest center of digital payment in the world today. And one particular transaction I would like to tell you, 1920, digital payment is 2,697 2, lakh crore. That is the amount of digital payment happening digitally on various digital platforms in India. Therefore, whether it is digital payment, the digital delivery of services, um, Justice uh, Crore for a kind foundation, six crore Indians are being subjected to digital literacy in a social program, which we are doing. 1.5 crore have been made digital literacy. I would like to also tell my friends present here the changing profile of India, digitally speaking. With proliferation of smartphone, I see many young boys doing Googling in the village of Darbhanga, Justice Crore for a kind foundation. I've seen it myself. And they show me very proudly that I employ the search engines of Google. That is what the smart computer has given to me. And that makes me very happy. North, South, East, West. This digital awakening of India is a matter of it. celebration and also accomplishment. But there are problems, I totally agree with you. Problems we need to acknowledge. And the problems are that we generate billions of data and the data become a big property. I always say, people say data is an oil. I don't, I say no, data is an asset. And today's world, it is a critical strategic asset we need to have. And therefore, the question arises as to who will own the data. And many of my international conferences on IT, I have been particularly advocating data of Indians belong to India. Data of Indians belong to the community. And data of Indians belong to the sovereign India. And I've been very, very emphatic that we shall not compromise on data sovereignty. And I'm very happy that this articulation which India has formulated is now finding global resonance. And the second thing which I have said very clearly, under no circumstances we shall tolerate any data imperialism. Let there be a sane data digital world globally administered. I'm very happy that this debate of digital inclusion and data democracy data sovereignty is now finding a global business. How data is important? Those who are eligible, they go makan mila ki, ineligible loko hi makan mil gaya. Data helps you identify that. Bharat ke jo loan lete hain, to aap loko sun ko hasi hogi, kuch log ek bank ko kehte hain ki my Personal income is very good income. Therefore, kindly help me with good loan. And when they take loan from other bank, they say, Hamari mali halat baut khara hai. Ab ye kaise chalega? There must be a data bank whereby those who get money, their conditions can be objectively analyzed. Just for a kind information, this is Sindha. Aaj desh ke 97 crore bank account aadhaar se link ho gaya. 
ये आधार से लिंकेज क्यों जरूरी है जो तो टेररिस्ट जो मनी लॉन्ड्रिंग करने वाले अपने अकाउंट का दुरुपयोग करते हैं बिजनेस अकाउंट खोल करके दोस्त अकाउंट खोल करके नाउ यू हैव एन आइडेंटिटी एंड अगेन आधार ऑथेंटिकेशन इज डन इन इंडिया वेयर बाय वी डू थ्री करोड़ ऑथेंटिकेशन एवरी डे नाउ व्हाट डज आधार डज वी नीड टू अंडरस्टैंड दैट मैं एक बैंक में गया उसने पूछा आपका बैंक अकाउंट क्या है आधार नंबर क्या है उसने सिस्टम को बताया ये आधार नंबर किसका है एंड द सिस्टम विल से इन थ्री सेकेंड दिस आधार नंबर बिलोंग टू रविशन सिस्टम विल मैच दैट नंबर विद द फिंगरप्रिंट एंड द आईरिस विच इज सेफ एंड सिक्योर एंड द आधार एक्ट दिस रोल वॉज ड्राफ्टेड बाई डेट अरुण जेटली एंड मीट टूगेदर एंड वी हैव इंश्योर द प्राइवेसी इन बेड इन द लॉ एंड इफ द आधार इंफॉर्मेशन इज pilfered for any extraneous consideration they can go to jail for three years and as a it law minister of india if i disclose my fingerprint to anyone else then i can be prosecuted there was a great pressure by police that we should be able to use the aadhar for biometric but no to do investigation so we have tried to keep it as secure and safe as possible but yes there are challenges and therefore we came with a data protection law which justice jha rightly referred to what we have done data protection law three things a no data of indian shall be taken without the consent and that consent must be voluntary number one number two that consent must be for a specific period uh, objective and if you go beyond that you can be held up and thirdly Three types of information critical only be hosted in India. Number one, number two, sensitive, which can go out of India with the consent of the owner of that data. And thirdly, general data which can be traded. Now let me tell you certain general things. Suppose there is an illness in a particular locality of India or particular district. Should we know the profile of that area, the social profile? But change your bimar parte in the land. But that data must be anonymous data, okay, with no names. The beneficiary part of it. Therefore, the health stack, the agriculture stack, and the education stack, which is the India bazaar, is going to create a powerhouse of data for India, and I want. Data refining in India to grow, data cleaning, data refining, data improvement, data innovation. It's a startup for a job. So, ye data economy ko desh bahut aage badhayega. But there must be consent number one. Consent should be voluntary number two. And if any, and I can tell you in the proposed law, we have kept the concept of data fiduciary, the trustee who. Take the data, the data protection authority, and if any company violates the terms of the directions of the data authority, it has to suffer millions and millions of rupees in damages and penalty. Therefore, these are the architecture which we have proposed for the most robust law justification committee which we have done. Very briefly on privacy, because Justice Crowell has made a very eloquent, um, I would say, comment on privacy with all its facets. We need to understand privacy today is a fundamental right. We acknowledge that that has to be. There should be no surveillance, no, no invasion. But we have to be a little pragmatic also. And today, the terrorist, the separatist, the breakers of India, are using digital platform in abundance. Not only in India but globally, they it has become a ready-made classroom for them to radicalize, to terrorize, to pick up the vulnerable sections, to indoctrinate them. Now, should we allow them a free hand? Should a terrorist or a corrupt have the shield of privacy? That's a larger political question, and I'm very happy. 
the Supreme Court in Puttuswami case quoted a very telling object of observation of Richard A. Foster. This is how observed. Privacy is the terrorist's best friend. And the terrorist privacy has been enhanced by the same technological developments so and so forth. The government has a compelling need to exploit digital exploit digitization in defense of national security. And they take the shield of their freedom of speech, the freedom of privacy, the shield of privacy, etc. We have to have a private. And therefore, the Supreme Court has rightly stated the legitimate state interest is important. But yes, as Honorable Bhagavad has rightly said, it must be reasonable, it must be proportionate. It must be appropriate to the needs that the government feels is needed. Because you need to understand in today's overpowering changing world is very, very important. You are able to track criminals and their design by employing good technological tools. And therefore, in pursuit of your investigation, that power should be given. Obviously, with safeguard that the Supreme Court itself has flagged. You know, my concern is very unique. And let me open my heart to both you, Mr. Mishra, because you are pursuing human rights. I was also a human rights activist. The number of parliaments as a lawyer, I shifted to Supreme Court in 2004, seeing India from that perspective of before I became minister again. Today, the democratic world is suffering a peculiar challenge. On the one hand, the terrorists, the radicals, the separatists have their own agenda from ISIS to across the border in Pakistan trying to weaken India and to anyone else or to rank criminal mafia, etc. Et you have to meet that challenge in a democratic way, giving due regard to human rights, to civil liberty, to ethical law. This conflict will keep on going, but let me flag certain issues to me today. What about the human rights of the victims of terrorism? Human right is important, very important. But does the human right of the victim of terror, radical killing, important or not? Is it not important to take up their cause? I think there's a need to have a robust balancing attitude when we appreciate the challenge. In the context of digital technology. If we see these things, then I'm very sure India, with its vast population of 150 crore plus, with great digital tool, with great human resource of talented people, you all will be happy to know that India's startup movement started in 15, 2015. Now, India has become the third biggest startup ecosystem in the world. Or Pachis Bache have become unicorn. Unicorn means one having a revenue of $1 billion plus, South Hajar Karo. Now, I'm very happy. Should I encourage them or I should not? I think I need to. That's the India I'm wishing to make of empowerment, of awakening, of tapping the best resources of India's digital and data technology. I think if we take into account those uh, objectives, then we have to make I want to make India a big digital economy. Do you know Facebook has the biggest presence in the world in India? WhatsApp has the biggest presence in the world in India. Twitter is the third and fourth. India's app economy is growing phenomenally. For you see, the national security for Pachas app ko ban bhi kiya hai. Data privacy par. Man Pradhanmantri ne kaha hai ki nai app Hindustani banao. We will encourage. Or lagbhag 2000 applications aachuk hai. 
वो भी बन रहा है इलेक्ट्रॉनिक विभाग में देखता हूं इलेक्ट्रॉनिक मैन्युफैक्चरिंग 2014 में भारत में सिर्फ दो मोबाइल फैक्ट्री अब 260 प्लस मोबाइल फैक्ट्री इंडिया हैज बिकम द सेकेंड बिगेस्ट मोबाइल मैन्युफैक्चर इन द वर्ल्ड फ्रॉम नंबर फाइव माई एम्बिशन इज टू बेक इंडिया नंबर वन सरपाक इन चाइना एज द बिगेस्ट मोबाइल मैन्युफैक्चर इन द वर्ल्ड एंड आई एम हैप्पी टू टेल यू टॉप वर्ल्ड कंपनीज आर वॉकिंग टूवर्ड्स इट So from electronic manufacturing to digital ecosystem to digital delivery of services to e-courts to e-kisan to e-health, all these are working together to empower India. We must be happy about it, but we must be cautious. And what is my concluding take? आप national highway पे चलते हैं तो accident होता है ना? होता है. तो क्या आप नेशनल हाईवे बनाना बंद कर देते हैं नहीं यू मस्ट टेक प्रिकॉशन सीट बेल्ट लगाइए ड्रिंकिंग ड्राइविंग मत करिए स्पीड को फॉलो करिए द सेम नॉर्म हैज टू बी फॉलोड इन द इंफॉर्मेशन हाईवे डोंट गिव योर पासवर्ड टू अ नोन फॉर पीपल बी कॉशियस फॉर द नॉर्म्स अभी देखिए कोविड में हम लोगों ने जो काम किया ऑल माई फ्रेंड विल बी हैप्पी टू नो 85% परसेंट ऑफ टेक्नोलॉजिकल इंडिया इज वर्किंग फ्रॉम होम बिकॉज वी रिलैक्स द वर्क फ्रॉम होम नॉम अभी कोविड में हम लोग टेक्नोलॉजी से जियो फेंसिंग अगर आप अपने क्वारंटाइन वार्ड से बाहर निकल गए तो यूल बी जेंटली रिमाइंडेड टू योर मोबाइल फोन प्लीज स्टिक टू फोर्टीन डेज बल्क मैसेजिंग कोविड सावधान हम लोग ने पच्चीस करोड़ मैसेज भेजे हैं टारगेट एरिया के टेक्नोलॉजी इज ऑफ ग्रेट हेल्प ऑल्सो इन इंप्रूविंग थिंग्स आरोग्य सेतु लगभग बारह करोड़ लोगों ने डाउनलोड किया है वॉट इज आरोग्य सेतु यू आर कॉशन इफ यू आर ग्रीन यू आर ओके इफ यू आर येलो यू हैव कम इन कंटैक्ट विद सेकेंडरी कंटैक्ट इफ इट इज रेड दैट मीन्स इट इज डेंजर प्लीज गो एंड सेट योर सेल्फ एंड बाई दैट यू आर एबल टू कन्वे टू योर रिलेशन ऑल्सो जो लोग भी इस नंबर से कंटैक्ट में आए हैं प्लीज टेक केयर By technology, we have done all this, and this is a completely privacy-proof, and the data is contained only for a limited time. So these are some of the challenges and experiences which I thought I must share with you as to how India is changing. But yes, let me conclude by saying, our government will never compromise on data sovereignty of India and Indians. This particular norm and null shall be tolerate any data and privilege of any part. data of india belongs to indians and to india and data is a strategic asset we have to use for india's development obviously sharing is important on this reciprocity on safety consideration so these are some of the issues i thought i must share with you uh, this is jha all my friends of the atmod i once again thank you it was a very emotional moment for me and let me conclude by a very emotional observation my father passed away rather young at the age of 74 suddenly this is crore aapko batao jis din ki death hui us din ko 12 case pass karna aur ek retired judge ki ek judge ki ki death ho gayi to humne kaha bhari par aaiye kaam ko bol ho jaye suddenly around afternoon he had a mild heart attack and he passed away in few minutes but let me share with you all my friends it appears all his blessings were reserved because my real rise started after his unfortunate departure both professionally and politically and to all my family therefore to utmost friends my deep gratitude ki aapne ek karyakram karaya this is sanjha this is patna high court to ashok chhabra ji to you mr mishra to ck prasad to all my friends who are me thank you namaskar thank you sir for your erudite rendition of an extremely complicated subject matter in such an accessible manner like all good things today's session must also come to an end it is my great privilege to propose a vote of thanks on behalf of patmbod and myself we are grateful to you sir honorable sri ravi shankar prasad for 
taking out the time for this event, I must inform this audience that, that despite such busy schedule, he has closely monitored all the preparations and we felt as if we were sailing effortlessly. Thank you, sir. Thank you once again. We extend our heartfelt gratitude to Honorable Mr. Justice Sanjay Karol, Chief Justice Patna High Court, who despite all the firefighting he has at his hand these days, readily agree, agreed to do the special address. We look forward to more patronage from you, sir. We also thank Honorable Justice Chandramoli Kumar Prashad, Chairman, Press Council of India, for sparing time to share the insight into the life of late Thakur Prashad and readily agreeing to spare his time at a very short notice. We thank Honorable Mr. Justice Anant Vijay Singh, Member Judicial NCLAT, for his special address. He has been available to us for sharing his knowledge with fellow lawyers whenever we have requested him. Many thanks, sir. I also bow down in thanking Honorable Mr. Justice S. N. Jha. Without him, this event could not have even taxied on the runway, let alone fly the way it did today. We are blessed to have you around, sir. Thank you again. I also thank Honorable Judges and other dignitaries who are amongst the attendees and who spared their time and graced this memorial lecture in the memory of late Thakur Prasad. Sirs, it is your affection that keeps us going in pursuit of ideals we have set for ourselves. Honorable Justice Dinesh Kumar Singh, Honorable Justice Chakradhari Saran Singh, Honorable Justice Adhush Kumar, Honorable Mr. Justice Dr. Anil Kumar Upadhyay, Honorable Justice Sanjay Kumar, and Honorable Justice Mohit Kumar Sa have greatly encouraged us by finding time for our events. Many thanks to your lordships. I also thank our president, Mr. Ashok Chabra, for encouraging and guiding us all the time. I must mention that the immense hard work and dedication of Atmod's core committee for the lecture series in Patna, Mr. Rakesh Kumar Samrendra, Mr. Binodanand Mish, Mr. Shekhar Singh, Mr. Amit Prakash, Mr. Ravinder Kumar, Mrs. Alka Verma, and Mr. Ajay Kumar. Besides them, I must also mention the efforts of Mr. Ardendu Moli, Advocate and Standing Counsel for the Government of India, in ensuring that preparations were on track. Thank you all for your hard work and dedication. Above all, I thank the participants for making this event a huge success and paying homage to an extraordinary personality that Thakur Babu was. Last but not the least, I would like to thank the Office of the Honorable Minister under the leadership of Mr. Abhay Kumar Singh IAS for their hard work and personal attention to this event. Thanks are also due to Team Atanbodh who kept the show running. In the end, I would seek forgiveness for many more people who deserve to be mentioned in my vote of thanks, but could not be mentioned due to time constraints. We are already seven minutes uh, beyond our time limits, uh, uh, and uh, Honorable Minister must have other engagements. With this centenary memorial lecture in the memory of late Thakur Prashad draws to a close, all participants can leave the meeting by pressing the red button on their screens. Thank you. Thank you to all again.